to exercise. Ready? Yep. I'll call to order the March 15, 2018 business meeting and ask uh, County Administrator Don Krupp to please take the roll. Well, good morning, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Of course, we're just uh, five days away from the first day of spring and the spring equinox coming up. Looking forward to it. We are uh, joined here this morning uh, with Mr. Uh, Stephen Madcor, who is our yeah. county council. And then I'm pleased to say that to my left is Mary Rathke serving as the clerk of the board. So glad to have you. Uh, I'll start uh, with Commissioner Humberston. Here. Commissioner Fisher. Here. Commissioner Reynolds. Here. Commissioner Schrader. Here. Commissioner Savas. Here. Chair Bernard. Here. Please join me in a pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, first up, I'd like to announce that the board will recess as the Board of County Commissioners and convene as the Housing Authority for the next item, including Housing Authority Commissioner Paul Reynolds. Thank you. Well, welcome. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We have a uh, public hearing this morning. Uh, it is a public hearing on the proposed 2018-2019 Housing Authority of Clackamas County Annual Plan. And we have our Housing Authority Director, Mr. Chuck Robbins, here to present this to you. Good morning, Commissioners, uh, Chair Bernard, Don, Mary. Thanks for having me here today. Again, I'm Chuck Robbins, Executive Director of the Housing Authority of Clackamas County. And as Don mentioned, this is the uh, our annual opportunity to uh, talk about what's going on at the Housing Authority. Uh, HUD, you know, defines what needs to be done at this meeting. So, you know, bear with me as I just run through a little bit of a script so that I get that all on the record. So there's going to be three elements to this public hearing. First is a review of last year's performance of the Section 8 Public Housing and Capital Grants Program a review of the proposed 2018-2019 annual plan and an opportunity for citizens to testify on the plan or the county's public housing needs and performance. Uh, just a little background, this plan was reviewed and approved by our resident advisory board. This is made up of Section 8 and public housing residents. That was done on January 11, 2018 and was out for public comment between January and March. No comments were received. Um, also just want to say the board does not have to take any action today. You know, the Housing Authority will staff will take any comments that we receive, make any amendments that are changes to the annual plan. Uh, we'll then resubmit the plan for your approval on a special meeting of the Housing Authority Board scheduled for April 5th. And uh, the uh, action plan is due uh, to HUD no later than April 17th. So let me just kind of jump in, give you some of the highlights about what's going on at the Housing Authority. First, uh, under the Section 8 program, we've got over 1,600 vouchers. These are the Section 8 vouchers that, are, that go out throughout the, the county and, and, frankly, throughout the state and the country in some cases. So we've, uh, uh, some of our vouchers are ported out to different parts of the country, you know, which is eligible under HUD. Anyway, uh, we receive about $13.5 million in assistance from HUD to, to make uh, for these payments. This is money that goes directly to the landlords on behalf of the residents. Uh, we receive about a million dollars of administration funds from HUD. That's about 72% of what HUD says it should cost to run our program. That proration is standard and it's something that's been in place for a number of years. So, uh, you know, clearly we're already in the hole, you know, just through operations. So we have to look to other sources to fill that hole. Um, we're currently spending about 103% of the funds that HUD gives us. That puts us in something called shortfall. And I'm going to go into a, you know, a little bit of detail on that you know, when I get into some of the challenges. For public housing, we're, uh, we've got about 545 public housing units. Uh, they generate about $1.6 million in rent. So everybody pays something. 
you know, maybe you know it, it may be just a minimal fifty dollars a month rent, or you know much higher. But there is there is rent that's generated from public housing. We receive about one point nine million dollars in uh, administrative funds for the uh, housing uh, for public housing, which is again prorated at about ninety percent of actual cost. The capital grants program, that's the third program, that is funds that HUD gives us to maintain the public housing units. It's about $881,000. Uh, since, well, I guess over the last eight years, those funds have been reduced by over 50%. Nationwide, what we're seeing is that uh, you know, HUD is underfunding the maintenance and improvement of public housing by over 55%. You know, in some of the, uh, I think I read someplace that, uh, you know, uh, New York Housing Authority, you know, the largest housing authority in the country has got like, you know, $1.3 billion worth of improvements that need to be made, you know, and, and, and get about, then they get about $500 million, you know, which, you know, well, I'd like to get $500 million, a lot I could do with that. Anyway, so that kind of gives you a feel for the landscape. Um, but it's not all bad. There's, there have been some, some real successes. And the one that I, I, I'm the most proud of is that uh, the Housing Authority of Clackamas County has met the high performer status. This is something that is, uh, you know, is kind of defined by HUD. And it says that we've met, met the highest standards for maintaining the physical conditions of public housing communities. I mean, we've got housing that's over 80 years old, but we're still able even with a minimal budget to at least maintain those properties at a high standard. That uh, we've meant high standards for the administration of the Section 8 program, the overall financial administrative management of the housing authority, and the obligation and expenditures of our federal funds. So something I'm very proud of, that goes, that's, that's all the staff, that's the work that they've done. Why that's important is that when you are a high performer, you are eligible for different types of grant programs that HUD uh, puts out so it's very important to do that and you know not everybody you know I'm not everybody's a high performer clearly they, uh, they set the standard pretty high um, another a big I think boost for us is that we've been asked to submit for an additional 25 bash vouchers bash vouchers are section 8 vouchers that are administered jointly with uh, HUD and the veterans so they're the veterans vouchers we currently had 51, so that's just going to boost us up to uh, 76. I think the reason, and 25 doesn't sound like a lot, but I don't even think Portland got 25. And I think the reason that uh, we were able to get this many is because we're the only housing authority in the state that has leased up 100% of the VASH vouchers we already had. So, you know, again, that, you know, that's just great work to the staff. And with all the housing that we've got going on, particularly the, uh, the Veterans Housing Project that we're looking at in uh, Oregon City, we seem to have some resources coming online that will make that 25%, or those 25 vouchers get used up very quickly. Um, under development, uh, yeah. Hold on to your seat. I think we're going to close on the Rosewood Terrace project in two weeks. You know, I've, I've only been working on this for three and a half years. So it just, uh, it just takes a long time to get that done. Uh, we'll be doing clearing immediately and probably scheduling some sort of official groundbreaking in April. Um, we've also were successful in a HUD application for the remodel of the Hillside Manor. That's the nine-story, 100-unit uh, public housing uh, building in uh, Milwaukee. In fact, there are a couple items on the consent agenda specifically dealing with uh, you know, the applications and all the paperwork necessary to get that done. Uh, and then the other one is uh, we received a $215,000 Metro grant, about $215,000. This is for the development of a community plan for Hillside Park. So that's the property just adjacent to the manor. So there's an awful lot going on at the Housing Authority and, a, and, a, and an awful lot that I'm very proud to be the executive director of. Uh, you, know, I get to, I, you know, I get the pats on the back and, and they do all the hard work. Um, challenges. The, uh, I know this doesn't sound bad, but uh, you know, one of the challenges is, you know, is funding and our funding has been flat. For the, you know, for the last couple of years. Now, flat funding sounds good, but actually flat funding is 
you know, uh, is a decrease uh, in funding just because costs continue to go up. You know, costs for construction, for maintenance, just personnel costs, insurance costs. So, I mean, it's good, and, I, and, it, and it's unfortunate that we're in a situation where we look at flat funding as a win, but, uh, you know, my, uh, uh, I'm, I am expecting that uh, we'll probably look at flat funding again, and, and we'll, we'll take that as a win given, you know, some of the, uh, the news articles that we saw about the, you know, um, getting rid of funding completely for some of our programs. Um, the, uh, the other challenge is, you know, just the lack of affordable housing units, you know, in Clackamas County. You know, currently, uh, you know, our rent restricted housing, those are, those are the units where we control the rents at a, at a, at a level that's affordable to people at 60%. The vacancy is less than one and a half percent. So, I mean, you know, those unit, the, the units are there, they're just not moving. So we need more units. And I'm going to roll back to that shortfall. I told you that uh, it's set, you know, with Section 8, we're spending about 103% of the money that HUD gives us. That's a projection. Something that I, you know, it took me a while to learn that a voucher is not a piece of paper. So it's, you know, one voucher doesn't necessarily mean one family gets helped. A voucher is money. And HUD says for the amount of money for this voucher you should be able to help one family. And what we're finding is that uh, we're having to spend more money for each voucher to help one family. So rather than having one family be helped with one voucher, we're helping 0.9 families with one voucher. So we're less than a family, so we're having to take money from other, you know, from, from the other vouchers. So now all of a sudden, rather than assisting 100% of the people we could assist, we're only assisting about 90% of the people that we, we should be able to assist. And that, and you were projected to even spend even more money than they give us. So when that happens, we go into what's called shortfall, and uh, we work very closely with HUD. The number one thing we do, we don't issue any more vouchers. Last year, we didn't issue a voucher for uh, over nine months most of the year, just so that we could get our costs down. Uh, you know, we immediately went out of shortfall, you know, about two months, and, you know, here I would expect at the end of March we'll be in shortfall again. So I think it's a, and as bad as that sounds, most of the housing authorities across the country are facing the same thing. I mean, you know, it still, it comes back to the supply. How, you know, if we're using vouchers on, in uh, market units, those market unit costs are really, really high, and they're just more than the voucher can afford. So we're working through that. That is a big challenge. So just finishing up very quickly, the big thing in here is the annual plan. Uh, there's a number of things in there. Uh, the big one has to do with adjustments to the Section 8 administrative plan and adjustments to the housing authorities admissions and continued occupancy plan. In both cases, we're talking about preferences. In section eight, we're reducing the number of preferences that we have out on the street. A preference is um, a, a, a promise to a particular agency that is serving a particular group that we're going to give you uh, so many Section 8 vouchers, and when you have a, a client that reaches, you know, that, you know, that needs a voucher that, you know, is in that program, you get to jump to the top of the list. Now, that's important, you know, we're dealing, you know, when we're, primarily those are set up for veterans, for very vulnerable uh, homeless, for victims of domestic violence. When I started, we had over 200 preferences we were giving every year. We only get about 100 vouchers returned every year. So little by little, we've been kind of weeding that down. So now we've set a standard of one for one. For every preference we voucher we give, we want to pull one person off our wait list. Our wait list is, you know, is currently sitting at about 1,000 you know, individuals. Some of those people have been on there for 10 years. And you know, if we give every, if we give all of the units to the pr uh, for a preference, we don't pull anybody off the wait list. So we, you know, you know, it, it's really up to us to make those to make those changes. 
Now, on the other hand, on, in, the sec in the public housing, we're actually going to add a preference. We've never had a preference for homeless before in public housing. And the only reason we're doing this, frankly, is that uh, the county puts together an application for the uh, continuum of care. This is a HUD application that brings in money to the county for homeless supported services. We get more points on that application if we have a homeless preference in our public housing. And it's such a competitive application that one or two points can make the difference between getting funding or not. COC brings in, you know, almost uh, over $2 million to the county. So anyway, sorry I went on a little bit, but that gives you a feel, you know, for what's going on at the Housing Authority, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Ken. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Robbins, I went through this trying to find something to ask a question about, and <clears throat> it was quite thorough, and I couldn't find anything. But in your presentation, I did find something that I'd like to ask a question about. Can you tell us why vouchers here go out of state? Absolutely. And I knew that was going to you know, prompt a question. I should have I prepared a better answer. Um, the, uh, so uh, Section 8 vouchers are tenant-based. That means a, a tenant can take that voucher and move it wherever they want to after they've lived with us for a year. Most of them stay, you know, in Clackamas County. Some, it's called porting, will port out to another housing authority. And a lot of those, you know, get ported into Portland or into Washington. However, there, you know, the federal requirements doesn't say that you have to stay in the area. It just says if you have a Section 8 voucher, you can move anywhere a voucher is, uh, is available. So the, the voucher is attached to the person and not the locale. That's exactly right. And in many cases, it's, uh, we do what's called the absorbing uh, a voucher. That means when somebody ports in, so we get somebody from uh, you know, another jurisdiction that comes in, we absorb that, they become our voucher. Uh, but because everybody's in shortfall, nobody can absorb anything. So uh, actually, it's kind of better for us when they move out of state, particularly if they move to the south because they're not charging as much on the rent yeah, as they are. If they move to California, we're in trouble. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, a, a good example was the, some of the folks in Oregon City. Some people move here and they, they are literally trapped. They can't afford to move back and the voucher gives them that ability. I mean, there was one particular person who mentioned that they, this gave them the opportunity to move back with their family in Florida. So there, there are advantages. I was just curious as to why that was, and I didn't understand that it was attached to the person and not to the locale. So, yeah, so that, that's the difference between a tenant-based voucher and a project-based voucher. We've talked about project-based yeah. vouchers. They're a Section 8 voucher, but they're attached to a specific unit in a project. Okay. Thank you very much. Commissioner Fisher, then Commissioner Schrader. <clears throat> yeah, I see in from the materials there's about four, a little over 4,000 people on the waiting list for a voucher. So that is our total wait list. That includes Section 8 and uh, public housing. Okay. Yeah, so it's, a, so it's but so it's only about a thousand, I think, for the Section Eight. For 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 the, the Section Eight vouchers the is voucher, a thousand, yeah. and yeah. we you said it was two hundred. You get two hundred available a year, and one hundred. We go generally to get so what we call them is return vouchers. So you know, for whatever reason, people move on, vouchers get returned. We get between a hundred, you know, ninety to one hundred and twenty a year, and uh, so those are the ones that we get to reissue. And that's where the preferences were causing us problems. Right. So then you have half and half. And then I'm just curious, and it may be in here somewhere, but how much money is one of those vouchers? Oh, you know, it, dep it depends on the family size. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you, know, it, you know, we figure around $1,100 a voucher, you know, I think is just a, you know, is just a good ballpark. And, uh, you know, right now, what did I, seems like, a, you know, a one-bedroom is renting about twelve to thirteen hundred dollars on the market. So you and can we see we then provide ten percent above that when you said yeah. So what will end up happening is that um, it, you know, now now we're getting into the weeds of this a little bit. But HUD says here is a uh, um, 
is the fair market rent. So HUD sets a fair market rent and says, this is what a voucher should be able to buy in your community. We then look at that and say, okay, we're going to set up a payment standard. And it used to be that we would set up payment standards, how much that we, you know, the most that we would use on a voucher of 95, 90% of fair market rent. Just because the voucher, you know, we, we could do that. There were enough units that would do that. We're now, you know, our payment standards are now 105%, 110% of fair market value. So we're having to pay, you know, we're having to pay more than, you know, kind of what that average uh, amount that the voucher is worth to get people into housing. And then where does that extra money come from? What what That category? money is is all part of that 13 what did I say? 13.5 million dollars that HUD gives us for vouchers. So again, that's why don't think of vouchers as as a it's paper, a it's money. a chunk of money. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Schrader. So one of the things I wanted to point out in attachment C um, was a statement of housing needs and strategy for addressing housing needs uh, because uh, Clackamas County, and, and I was going to ask Chuck uh, to talk about this a little bit, was actually one of the first counties in the nation to uh, actually move through the affirmatively furthering, furthering fair housing uh, process that was a new process, I believe, Chuck, that HUD had set up, and we actually pulled together our regional partners uh, with a set of six goals and actually are required, I think, to review this quarterly. And if you could tell a little bit about what we did at the National Association of Counties, because they actually asked us to talk about what our experience was. So you're talking about the, our experience with uh, preparing the assessment of fair housing plan? Yeah. So. Uh, because we're federally funded, we're always we've always been required to meet the uh, uh, the the law as identified in the Fair Housing um, Act. What we've never really had was a very good explanation of how you meet that. So for years, we did something called the analysis of impediments to fair housing choice. That was you know very prescriptive, and it looked at things like land use and um, uh, the uh, the lending practices in your community, a lot of things that were outside the control of a county. Land use we can do, but some of it's dictated by the state. So then HUD came around and says, okay, we're going to massage this. We're going to put together a plan that allows you to identify the specific goals and the, and the actions that you can take to further. Then that was this assessment of fair housing. We were one of the first eight I think counties in the country that had to do it. Uh, again, you know, I keep saying this, very, very proud of the work that was done. In this case, it was uh, uh, the Community Development Division that did it. But we not we put together a plan that you know not only you know met but exceeded their expectations. We got ours approved. They said they'd take 90 days. Ours got approved in 30 days with no changes. So uh, you, know, you know, you know, so that's the work that we're doing now. We've since HUD has since um, uh, just kind of stopped doing the AFH. They says, you know, we're, we've got to go back. We need to look at things. I think it's a mistake. I think that the tool that HUD put together to put together this uh, the AFH, the Assessment of Fair Housing, was outstanding. Probably the best work that they've done. And I think we ended up with a plan that was better for the county than we've ever had before. Okay. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I'll open the public hearing and ask if anyone would like to testify on this matter. And Faith, I do have one card. Please introduce yourself. And My name is Faith Leith, and I wasn't going to testify on this today, but um, I've lived in Oregon City for nearly 20 years, and I just happened to have spent the night last night at my church with two homeless families. And so my questions are... Um, we're part of the SUN program, sheltering our neighbors. Yes, okay. And I just wondered how that works into your used to, I've done this for, we've done this probably six years, I think, and it's several churches that uh, work together to, to keep homeless families for two, two families at a time, for two weeks at a time, and they rotate, so it gives them two months before they move into the Annie Ross house. Mm -hmm. And then I heard that the Annie Ross house is 
they're not going there, so I don't know where these families are going come Sunday. And so I was very concerned about them, but so what is the alternative to the Annie Ross houses being changed into apartments? Um, no, actually what's happening with the, the Annie Ross house, Annie Ross is, sits on the campus of Northwest Housing Alternatives. So, you know, part of that campus, they have the shelter, which is the Annie Ross House, administrative offices, they've got a lot of permanent housing and some transitional housing. So what, Annie, uh, what NHA is doing, Northwest Housing Alternatives, is actually redeveloping that whole campus, increasing the number of beds at Annie Ross and, and, and increasing the number of housing units there on campus. So yes, it, but but they are having to close it down for a while because for how they long? have to. Uh, you know that I can't tell you. You know, but I know that the priority is to get the because they don't have to build everything at once. They're going to get the shelter done first. Okay. And uh, you know, and and where you go, if you've got you know you've got families that you know that are homeless or you know are are look like they're in threat of becoming homeless, we have what's called the Chaw the coordinated housing access phone line. Uh, and uh, if you, you know, if you give me your information, I'll make sure that somebody contacts you and lets you know what that CHA number is. Um, I, you know, it's not the answer. And uh, you, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't want to build up people's hopes. You can't call into that and immediately find a place, but it puts you in line because I mean, we all know there's there's a huge need out there. There's even a wait list on the CHA, but it's at least ident it's a one door to identify all the potential resources that that family could be available for. Yeah, and these both these families, single parent with two teenagers and a and a, and a toddler, and the other one is a, a gentleman with a, with his daughter, and who he rescued from an abusive mm -hmm. situation. So. Um, they both have two jobs, so it's been really a challenge um, taking care of them there because people are coming and going all day, all evening long. But, but I was I was just wondering, um, how does Sun work into this? Do you you know what Sun is? Well, I, I'm not okay. specifically, un, I, but I understand what the mission staff. is. Yeah, and again, I think that uh, the the opportunity for the county to work with your program is through the CHA and through our, you know, coordinated our uh, continuum of care program. Okay. And that actually is something that maybe the SUN program would like to sit on the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, we have a committee, our homeless committee that deals specifically with these and we're, and it's, and it's open oh, up to anybody that provides these kinds of services. So again, if, you know, let's connect after, yeah, I'll get your information sure. and, uh, and I'll share that. And uh, I was just curious, uh, have there been any changes since HUD has Changes gone? on? Um, like you mentioned something, but I mean, has it changed in the last year since HUD? In terms HUD of the gone? funding? Yeah, in terms of anything working with HUD? No, frankly. Okay, You good. know, the, uh, uh, I do believe, however, that they have increased the appropriations for discretionary um, uh, domestic programs. So at least we're hopeful that HUD will get some portion of that. I think the administration, you know, was reducing the HUD, overall the HUD budget by about 18%. That's right. I don't believe that that is going to happen. So that's why, you know, again, you know, my, my, my little spies are telling me, you know, <laughs> yeah, that that's it, what I heard. It was a HUD was going to be slashed. So I was afraid. Yeah, I don't, I, do, I don't believe that's going to happen. However, that doesn't mean that they won't still attack. The home program is a program that they've had problems with. And that's me. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, the, um, and the capital grants. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay, I'll close the public hearing and announce there will be no board action on this item today. The item will come back to the board at the April 5th regular scheduled business meeting at 10 a.m. The next item is the Housing Authority Consent Agenda, and I'd ask the clerk to read the agenda by title. You bet. It's um, Housing Authority Consent Agenda. Under um, number one, in the matter of writing off uncollectible accounts for the third quarter of fiscal year 2017-2018, 
Approval to enter into a construction contract with DGS General Construction to replace windows, siding, and paint in public housing. Approval of an intergovernmental agreement between the Housing Authority and Metro for the Hillside Master Plan. Uh, resolution 1927, approval to apply to house, Oregon Housing and Community Services for 9% low income housing tax credit for the renovation of Hillside Manor. And approval of a professional services contract with Scott Edwards Architect for architecture and engineering services for the renovation of Hillside Manor. And that concludes the Housing Authority Consent Agenda. Thanks. Do any member of the Commission want to remove any of the items? I entertain a motion. I move we approve the Housing Authority Consent Agenda. Second. We moved and second that we approve the Housing Authority Consent Agenda. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now I'll announce that the board will adjourn as the Housing Authority Board and reconvene as the Board of County Commissioners for the remainder of the meeting. And uh, this is a portion of citizen communication. And first, I'm going to have Linda Orzen come up. She has a presentation. No, make it brief. Thank you, Linda. Please introduce yourself. Linda Orzen. I'm a resident of Oregon City, a professional volunteer in Oregon City. And uh, I think this is a perfect segue. Uh, can, am I on? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, way back a couple months ago when I first heard about the project of the pods, the veterans pods, I was very excited and thought, what can I do to help? And I thought, well, you know, I am a seamstress. So right before Christmas time, I started gathering uh, polar fleece and started making blankets. And I made 15 blankets for the pods, which I'm presenting to you today. My dad was a World War II veteran, and I figured this was the least I could do to give back. And that's, that's, that's my presentation. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, I'm sure they'll be very much appreciated. And if you wouldn't mind, we'd love to uh, take a photo with you. Photo up. I'm there. All right. <laughs> And then we have Diane uh, Gruber and Elaine Newland. Thank you for coming today. Well, I guess I'll begin because, oh, there you are. <laughs> you want to go first? No, you can go first. Okay. All right. Oh, okay. I'm Diane Gruber, Diane L. Gruber, a 30-year resident of Westland, a semi-retired attorney, and a writer for two blogs. Ah, uh, well, Mr. Bernard, 
The more you try to defend your disgusting behavior, the more you make, more trouble you make for yourself. I was merely disgusted with your remarks to Julie Parrish, my representative, but your, but your remarks last week made me mad. They really made me mad because you disrespected over half of Clackamas County residents with your remarks. Three times you said, screw you, to our constitutionally elected president. Constitutionally elected Donald Trump, President Trump. Whether you liked the results of the election or not, Donald J. Trump is our constitutionally elected president. Both he and the office deserve respect. The screw you remarks came out of your mouth, Mr. Bernard, so don't try to fall back on the fact that you were quoting others. You chose to quote, you chose what to quote, and you chose to say, screw you three times to our constitutionally elected president. By disrespecting our president, you are disrespecting 79,000 Clackamas County residents who voted for President Trump. You are also disrespecting the Clackamas County residents who voted for a third party candidate, but are Trump supporters now that they see the improvements that he has brought. You are disrespecting the residents who voted for candidate Clinton, but became Trump supporters since he was inaugurated. You, are also, you also disrespected the other half of Clackamas County residents those that are eligible to vote but did not vote. That was about half of our residents. The majority, uh, adults, the majority of them are Trump supporters. So, Mr. Bernard, you disrespected well over half of our fellow Clackamas County residents with your screw you <coughs> remarks about President Trump. Now, two weeks ago, I passed out pamphlets that contained the U.S. Constitution to everyone in the room, including all you uh, commissioners. In case you have not had time to read it, allow me to give you a brief civics lesson. Our wonderful Constitution outlines who is eligible to run for president of the United States and how he or she is to be elected. President Bill Clinton received 43% of the popular vote, but our Constitution deemed him to be president. 43%. When Americans discovered that he was a sexual predator and had sexually abused an unpaid White House intern in the Oval Office, that he was still our constitutionally elected president and he still deserved respect as our president. When President Clinton was caught committing perjury and obstruction of justice, I, for one, did not want him run out of office, even though I had not voted for him either time, because he was our constitutionally elected president. Even though he only received 43% of the popular vote in 1992, Bill Clinton became president because he won the Electoral College. Donald Trump received 46% of the popular vote. He became president because he won the Electoral College. You need to finish up. I am finishing up. Okay. President Clinton received 44 million votes, and Donald Trump received 63 million votes. Now, did that make Donald Trump more of a president than Bill Clinton? Of course not. They're both constitutionally elected. President Trump deserves respect as our constitutionally elected president, and so do the residents of Clackamas County who support him. You claim to be nonpartisan, but we all know you're an alt-right, alt-left Democrat, Mr. Bernard. Your display last week showed that you harbor resentment for Trump supporters. How can you properly represent all of Clackamas County residents when you resent over half of us, when will you resign? I hadn't prepared for this speech or talk, so I don't have it written out, so I'm going to be speaking from my heart. Um, I'm, um, my husband and I have lived in Clackamas County for 40 years. Um, and we have been involved with Clackamas County on land use issues for most of them. And we've worked with Jim some on and off, and I want to express my gratitude to Jim and thank him very much for a very caring kind of representation of all of us taxpayers. And he has spent our money well, and 
I think he's one of the best commissioners we've ever had. So um, um, the second thing, I want to protest this movement against him. I, I feel screwed. I feel screwed by them as a taxpayer because they're wasting my precious time at these commission hearings. They're taking energy away for things that um, can be well done by our commissioners. And I feel screwed, screwed, screwed. And I also feel screwed as a woman because they're taking one little word, screwed, and changing and make, and screwing the movement of women lately because of one word and it's using it against men, one word against men. So when it really should be, um, I don't know, it's just to me <laughs> incomprehensible and I think it's more political. I am not an, uh, I'm an independent, I'm not a political animal. I am not angry until I got this, we got this thing in the mail. I don't know if people have said it, seen it, and I'll pass it. Do you want to pass it around for the commissioners to see? It's a, a movement, it's being financed when you drill down by the same people that financed Ludlow. So, um, I, it, uh, that's when I got angry, is when I got this thing in the mail. Uh, I did vote for Julie, and I'm not going to vote for her anymore. I did email her on that um, thing that's being passed around. I'd like it back. Um, and she responded, but she wasn't quite as nice as you think she is, Martha. Um, so, I mean, I was surprised because I had listened to your comments that she was okay and had accepted. So I was surprised at her response. She's buying into this um, one word, trying to harass people with this one word. So anyhow, where am I? <laughs> okay, so I want to tell you, Jim, that my husband and I appreciate you. You care. You really make the world a better place, and I want to thank you for that, and that you make it much better than your previous chairman. <laughs> Thank you. Last uh, pool and Faith Lee. You can have a photo of it. You can even go first if you like. Oh, that's okay. I'll let you. <laughs> good morning, Les Pool. It's good to see some people here. I live in Gladstone. Um, before we got into this, as it's been described, unnecessary waste of time financed by so-and-so, um, we were working on some issues like the roads. One of the other things that was on my mind was evening meetings, something that I knew would disappear as soon as, just as, about as soon as Chair Bernard became the, uh, the chair. Evening meetings went away. We should have evening meetings in Clackamas County, and hopefully at the end of this, this session, we'll hear some comments in support or opposition to that idea. The public needs to be able to get here, not just, not just those that can fit it in their schedule. So let's really work on that, and by all means, let me know how many signatures on an unofficial petition I need to walk in here with to get that on the agenda. Um, it's just something that needs to happen. We need to have access. Um, real quickly, I'd like to play a little something here. I brought some video. You talk about history. I brought some video with me, but I can't play it. I can only play a little audio. So I'll play a real quick clip here for you. Let's see. So it's interesting that that, that battle was led by folks like Les Poole. The tree ordinance. Now we've got a church that is uh, selling and the tree and they want to preserve trees. The tree ordinance battle was actually fought by the same guy, Les Poole, who tried to stop the tree ordinance, which was actually asked by the community to save trees in the Oak Grove area. So that, that occurred. Gladstone Library. The Gladstone Library was another uh, project that was proof, again, fought by Les Poole, 
and the voters uh, withdrew the support of that library. Now we're in this mess. So light rail to uh, Park Avenue was never planned to go there. The tree ordinance would have saved the trees at that church. The Gladstone Library would have been built right now. And that same guy who came up here and complains about what we do is the same guy who caused all this trouble. And I'd love to see his expertise about rural development. Uh, it's just a... We'll end that there, and I'm sure that the audio was probably picked up well by the recording system. I'm not sure how well it projected in the room. But in essence, that was just a clip of the ridiculous, ridiculous pack of lies presented by Commissioner Bernard in 2016 when he personally attacked me. And I'll conclude just by letting you all know that if, 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 if someone, if someone who was an elected official, looked at you, Ken, and said, boy, I'd really like, and made a reference and a joke out of your experience with probation or, or, or dealing with the things you have in your resume, your background, and sat up here and attacked you after a meeting, and did things like that, and said things like that, and distorted the public record, and attacked something that you're actually very, very versed at, you would be outraged. Now, I'm going to bring plenty more video for you folks to watch, and I hope in the future you do, because I think you'll start to see that there's a lot of enabling going on here. One of, one of the persons that's enabling, and like I used to do myself, didn't really know they were doing it, is Commissioner Fisher. There's also folks in this room that are enabling. Enabling is conduct. Now, I'll be back next week, and by the way, this isn't financed by anyone. It's not costing me a dime to come down here and bring you the truth because I've lived through all of it and I've been here and anyone can find it on the public record on your website, anyone. So we'll get into the light rail issue next week and we can discuss that as well. We can ask about some of your conflicts and your failure to recuse yourself. I'm out of time. Otherwise, I could go on for at least another 10 minutes. Thank you. My name is Faith Leeds. Is it okay to go? Go ahead. My name is Faith Leeds, and I've lived in Oregon City nearly 20 years, and I didn't know I was going to speak earlier. So um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm a policy and process person, not a personality person. None of my issues can be dealt with if those elected cannot work together. together. Nothing being done means that, that community problems that local businesses cannot or will not solve, they need to be solved at the county level. So after several discussions concerning the current Board of Commissioners, I have decided this is a group that works together solving problems very well. Many points of view, cooperation, mutual respect, we should support their efforts on our behalf. I hope those who take time to speak at these meetings would stay until the end of the, of the meetings and listen to the commissioner's reports. It gives you more understanding about what they do during the week on our behalf. Thank you for your service. And by the way, the lady with the blankets, um, my family, she's going to give me some blankets for the kids, um, and we're going to meet after this meeting. So this was a very positive meeting for me. Very, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Ever tall. Everett Hall and Tim Lussier. Go ahead. Hello there. Uh, looks like the, uh, I, I really didn't come to talk about Commissioner Bernard, but you know, the topic of the day is that it uh, looks like the jackals aren't going away. When Julie Parrish spoke up, she spoke up, you know, for me, the little guy, by advocating lower taxes, which is what I talked about last time. <clears throat> I stand in the arena of ideas. The best ideas rise to the top, the bad ideas go away. The, the history of American politics has been insults on both sides. I mean, take a look at the Congress. The insults that flew back and forth in the 1800s were were fast and furious. Even today, they do insults to each other, fast and furious. 
and uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, one of our founding fathers died as a result of the what happened with the um, uh, when he insulted somebody else's wife, Aaron Burr's wife, and it resulted in a duel, and the founding fathers died. Now, I'd like to propose a compromise so that we can get past this issue, and that would be that that and you're not going to like it, but perhaps Commissioner Bernard could switch seats with one of the other commissioners, make the, one of the other commissioners chairman, but you know, uh, then Bernard could still remain on the board, have influence, have his vote, you know, uh, and all that. But anyhow, the real topic I came to here to talk about today was um, on the Hal Lindsey Report, which is of Friday nights at uh, 6 o'clock on Channel 20, he talked about the school shootings and what's been going on with that, okay? He said in the entire 18th century, there was one school shooting in the United States. In the 19th century, there were 28 school shootings. And, uh, and then, don't forget, that was when the Civil War was going on, so you would expect something, okay? In the 20th century, there were 227 school shootings. In the 21st century, which is only 18 years old, there have been uh, 207 school shootings already. So what's changed? Something's changed in America, okay? In 1962, the Supreme Court ruled that prayer in the school it was unlawful. Without a moral anchor, these children have become selfish, self-centered, and self-righteous, and they are, they are without self-control, brutal, and haters of good. good. In 1962, there were almost no gun control laws, and in that year, there were no school shootings. Since that time, we have, we have tried to control people with gun laws. But the fact is that, that the person behind the gun is at fault, not the gun itself. These people have an, uh, no moral anchor. <clears throat> we need to remember God's name. <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse, me, excuse me. And to keep it holy. Because without God, every man does what's, what he considers right in his own sight. <clears throat> and now we are paying the awful price. I suspect that in days past, this county government uh, started the proceedings with a prayer to Holy, holy God. Go ahead. The body of government can... Uh, set an example, this body of government can set an example by opening each meeting uh, with an open prayer to God. And to ask for guidance and moral strength, which I don't apparently have. This would uh, set an example for others to follow. <clears throat> the Congress of the United States opens their proceedings with, a, with an open prayer and again, Hal Lindsey, Friday night, 6 o'clock, Channel 20. Thank you. Thank you. Tim. Hi, everybody. Commissioners, this is Tim Lucier. I'm a native Oregonian and a lifelong resident of Clagmas County. Uh, I mentioned last time, other than a few years, I went to college in Hawaii, where I was able to get a scholarship from Clackamas Community College. Uh, I grew up in Westland, proud Westland High School. Um, I, since the last gentleman spoke about uh, school shootings uh, here at this county commission meeting, even though you don't have purview over gun laws, I think it is appropriate to address that. Uh, while I was a Westland High School student, I did uh, serve as a sheriff's cadet for two years, which I mentioned previously, so I know a little bit about uh, security and, and that issue. I'm not here to make friends with any of you. I'm not here. I don't have political business before you. I don't have uh, business from my entities or anything before the county. Uh, I'm here as just a native Oregonian that's worried about the country and worried about the future of the state. Um, when I was a sheriff's cadet on that note, I did help the Clagmas County Sheriff's Office SWAT team with a lot of training, including at Wilsonville High School for an active shooter. I was uh, at Camp Rilea where they also did role playing. So I was shot as a pretend actor throughout those trainings. I also did reserve trainings with the Sheriff's uh, Office Reserve. So I know a lot about that issue and it's very, very personal to me. So I'm glad that that gentleman brought it up. Uh, I am here today though as just a civilian, just as a citizen and just as a registered voter. And uh, we here have an issue before Clackamas County. The government, as I've mentioned previously, is officially a sanctuary county. 
According to President Trump's executive order, Clackamas County and the state of Oregon are forbidden from getting infrastructure dollars. According to the sanctuary state lawsuit that uh, Jeff Sessions uh, sued California last week to hold commissioners, city councilmen, and other lawmakers who are violating federal law, you are all put on notice that as Clackamas County, as a sanctuary county, you have to either abide by federal law or violate it. And going forward, uh, I've asked you, Jim Bernard, will you resign? I'm gonna ask you again, will you resign? You there, Commissioner? I'm asking you direct. You should, you should ask or answer to the voters. If you're not gonna answer, then I'll hold this up again. The woman previously who said screw you, to, to just get that out there, when you referenced it last week, that screw you cancer is a common community language. You said screw you to a woman. I've been here five or six times, and I'd like to just hold this up for the record. You wrote screw you Julie Parrish at 8 p.m. 8.45 on January 23rd from a page called Clagmas County Chair Jim Bernard. You got 14 likes, 12 comments, and one share before everybody called you out to delete it. You signed 2017-93. If you are any other employee except the elected member who's apparently untouchable, you would have resigned. You should have resigned. You told Julie Parrish to collect coupons to pay for her taxes, for your taxes, for her health care. So are you going to do the right thing and resign? Thank you for coming No. Today. Okay, you're not. All right, next up we have a hearing of Ordinance 022018, amending chapter. Well, Don, I'll yes, turn it over uh, to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a public hearing. It is the second reading of an ordinance, Ordinance 02-2018, amending chapter 8.04, relating to public health certificates of sanitation, licenses, and contested case procedures. As of the Clackamas County Code, we have Kathleen Rastetter here to present this item to you. Good morning, Chair Bernard, Commissioners. Um, this is the second reading on this proposed amendment to amend Chapter 8.04. As I said last time, uh, our local public health authority, through the grant of authority by the Oregon Health Authority, regulates sanitation and health laws at the local level. We are amending our code to be consistent with the state law, and uh, unless you had any questions, I would ask that this pass on second reading by title only. Do any commissioners have any clarifying questions? Seeing none, I'll open the public hearing and ask if anyone would like to testify on this item. Uh, seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move we read ordinance number 02-2018 by title only. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we read ordinance number 02-2018 by title only. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Clerk, please read the ordinance by title only. Okay, ordinance 02-2018, an ordinance amending Clackamas County Code Chapter 8.04, Public Health Certificates of Sanitation, Licensing, and Contested Case Procedures. I entertain a motion to adopt the ordinance. Mr. Chairman, I move we adopt ordinance number 02-2018, amending Chapter <coughs> 8.04, Public Health Certificates of Sanitation, Licenses, and Contested Case Procedures of the Clackamas County Code. Second. It's removed and seconded that we adopt Ordinance 02-018, amending Chapter 8.04, Public Health Certificates for Sanitary, Sanitation, Licenses, and Contested Case Procedure of the Clackamas County Code. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Next item is the consent agenda. I'd ask the Thank clerk you. to read the consent agenda by title only. Okay, today's consent agenda under Health, Housing, and Human Services, approval of amendment number one to a revenue intergovernmental agreement with Oregon Department of Human Services, Office of Vocational Rehabilitation Services for Job Placement and Job Retention Services. 
Approval of an intergovernmental agreement with Clackamas County and the City of Estacada for the Shafford Street Reconstruction Phase 1 Improvement Project. Under the Department of Transportation and Development, approval of a partition plat consent affidavit between Community Development and the Clackamas County Surveyor's Office. Under elected officials, approval of previous business meeting minutes and a request by the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office to enter into an annual operating and financial plan with the USDA Forest Service, Service for Cooperative Law Enforcement Services in the Mount Hood National Forest. Under technology services, approval of a service level agreement between Clackamas Broadband Exchange and the City of Sandy. Under business and community services, a board order approving a tax foreclosed property and declaration as surplus and established minimum bid amount. Under county council, a release of a reversionary clause related to property previously conveyed to North Clackamas School District Number 12. Under our juvenile department, approval of an intergovernmental agreement with the state of Oregon, Oregon Youth Authority for the Georgetown Evidence-Based Decision-Making Certificate Program. And under public and government affairs, approval of an intergovernmental agreement between Clackamas County and Metro related to Willamette Falls Locks. That concludes today's consent agenda. Great, I'll entertain a motion. Oh wait, uh, do any commissioners want to remove, pull an item from the consent agenda? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Next item is administrator updates. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I've just got a couple of items for you. I wanted to let you know that earlier this week, um, our uh, uh, 911 uh, operation, emergency communications, uh, known as CECOM, switched over to a new emergency dispatch system. Uh, and of course, uh, this is what our 911 center staff uses uh, to track all of our 911 and also non-emergency calls uh, that we uh, work with fire, police, and emergency medical services for residents in need. This particular undertaking, this conversion, has been actually years in the making. And as you can imagine, it involved considerable amount of uh, planning, a lot of careful thought in, in order to make sure everything works, because people's lives literally depend on this system working. Uh, CECOM had to make the switch because our previous dispatch system was no longer being supported by its uh, maker that, and leaving it susceptible to failure. Uh, the great news is that uh, the transition has gone very smoothly with no major snafus. Uh, and uh, the big benefits to the new system will allow us uh, to better share resources with our partners in the region, including Washington County, Columbia County, uh, and Lake Oswego, all of whom uh, collectively purchased the system with us, uh, and we expect that this will also lead to future cost savings as well, so we're looking forward to that. I just wanted to thank the staff uh, who were all involved in making this very long uh, endeavor uh, a successful transition. I especially want to acknowledge our outgoing director, Mr. Bob Kazi, who is going to be leaving us next week to go to work for the city of Portland. Bureau of Emergency Communications, uh, and uh, while we are uh, sorry to see Bob uh, leave, we also uh, want to congratulate him on his new opportunities there. Uh, I also want to uh, acknowledge the work of Cheryl Bledsoe and Mark Spross uh, there with the team in helping to make this transition uh, as seamless and uh, effective as it has been. So thank you. Uh, the other item I have is uh, I wanted to let you know that we're getting ready to kick off this year's CLAC Co Academy. This is what we refer to as our Citizens Academy. Uh, we provide a series of classes to give members of the community an opportunity to learn more about county services and operations. It's really a community leadership development program. Uh, and I can tell you that this year we had some 95 citizens apply to participate in the program. That's uh, up from 53 
citizens who were in the program last year. And what we're doing is, is we're retooling the program. Uh, we want to uh, provide this opportunity so that everyone who applied can participate. So we've been uh, revamping the program so all 95 applicants uh, will be able to, to uh, be a part of the program this coming year. And we look forward to the first class coming up this next month. Now, I was going to also say something about uh, the VASH vouchers, but Mr. Robbins uh, beat me to it a little earlier. Uh, and I, uh, all I can say is uh, it, it is a testament to the good, hard, uh, talented work of our housing authority staff that uh, we, are, we are able to see uh, more capacity with these vouchers and serve more veterans in our community. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, first up is Paul. Yeah, uh, last few days here have been a lot, I've been approached by a lot of folks. Uh, last evening I was um, at the uh, Colton CPO and uh, things like transportation funding and tolling came up particularly. And this morning at JPAC and part, prior to the meeting, even um, an elected official um, came up to me with a misunderstanding. And, you know, it is fair and it shouldn't be, um, uh, it shouldn't be a criticism by any means, but this is, you know, transportation funding is very complicated and people often get confused about why we're spending monies here or with these dollars. And so an example of that is that I think there's a belief that uh, people out there um, think that gas tax dollars are paying for, um, you know, substantial improvements in either light rail, which they cannot, or uh, bike ped, which they cannot, uh, only a fraction. So there's legal restrictions on all these dollars. These, these dollars are um, basically marked and set aside for particular things and done in a very legal, structured way. And um, so when they hear a decision being made about what we're doing our, on our transportation system plan, uh, they confuse those projects together. Um, all to say that uh, I'll do my best to clarify. You know, I'll do my best to clarify that uh, the House Bill 2017 uh, that the legislature passed uh, last year uh, specifically uses or raises gas tax, uh, gas tax, gasoline taxes for funding the transportation highways and roads. And part of that bill included funding, which was used other monies, not gas tax dollars, for transit improvements. Um, and those dollars are derived out of employee payroll type taxes. So all these monies and, you know, lottery monies are being used for what's called Connect Oregon for other things like freight, rail, and so on. So uh, um, uh, happy to clarify what those are, but I, the language is pretty clear um, in the bill of how those dollars, where they can be used and how they're derived. So, um, you know, if the other discussion that came up recently, I think Commissioner Fisher spoke to it a couple weeks ago with regards to the potential bike ped bridge. Well, those are not gas tax dollars that will be funded, those will be funded with. Those are other dollars um, that are set aside um, to be funded. So. Um, uh, just wanted to let people know that um, the discussion came up about a potential regional bond. There are a lot of discussions being circulated. Will that be a billion dollars? Will that be $20 billion? And where would those monies come from? And how will 205 get funded? And we don't know the answer. I think we're seeking the, really that answer or clarification. Will the, will the legislature fund that portion of 205? Will it be a regional bond? Will it be the revenues derived from tolling? Um, those are a lot of reasonable questions um, and unfortunately the state and all the transportation agencies that have control over that have not specified or clarified how that would happen but uh, I'm honored to be in the role of kind of representing the county as best I can on transportation and uh, answer those questions and if anyone has any questions that are watching at home by all means don't hesitate to contact the county and I'll, I'll help either if I can't answer the question I'll direct people to the answer and the source but um, you know, sometimes we get blamed for things or, or associated with spending monies that um, pe people feel that's not right. You know, my gas tax dollars should be going there, and frankly, they're probably not. But uh, that's what I have for today, and um, look forward to uh, uh, continuing our work here on the commission. And um, uh, I guess we have Valentine's, or not Valentine's, but St. Patrick's Day right around the corner. That's next week, right? Saturday. 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 So happy St. Patrick's. Patrick's Day. Wear orange. Yeah. Wear orange? <laughs> Where's my green tie? Start, I'm going to start trouble. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's been a busy week. 
uh, like uh, others of my colleagues, I attended Congress, Congressman Schrader's town hall meeting uh, and then had the fun of going to the uh, rodeo coronation event down in Canby for this year's uh, rodeo. Um, <clears throat> moderated the 8th Annual China Economic Forum uh, regarding exports to China on behalf of our businesses here in Clackamas County and in Oregon. Met uh, last week with Mayor Knapp and the union president from the fire department regarding a land use issues that we're hopefully going to be able to move forward uh, that will benefit uh, Wilsonville and ultimately uh, all of us here in Clackamas County. Met with staff and Commissioner Savas on a low-cost, low-income manufactured housing alternatives that we're going to take a look at at uh, some other ways of trying to provide uh, low-income housing for, for folks that's a little different than the usual ways that it gets done. I met the, with the city manager of, um, of Lake Oswego, Mr. Lazenby, regarding broadband services that they are interested in partnering with us on in Lake Oswego. Um, briefly spoke at the Developers Forum where we discussed uh, the, the opportunities with cross-laminated timber and what some of our staff are doing to prepare uh, for the developers to be able to m use that material in, in, um, uh, in their projects. Uh, met with Councillor Shane this morning of Milwaukee regarding the uh, water and environmental services uh, governance issues. Uh, I met with Mayor Gamba also regarding the broadband uh, issues uh, in Milwaukee and the opportunities there possibly to work with them in a partnership on broadband services, uh, expanding that to not only their city offices but their citizens in the long run. And um, let's see. Oh, I did find out that I was, um, I, this is what happens when you're not at the meeting. I was appointed <laughs> to a broadband committee uh, as a result of the new legislation uh, looking at broadband services throughout uh, Oregon. So I'll be serving on that committee uh, on behalf of Clackamas County at the state level. Um, and then tomorrow we, the, uh, there will be a Chinese contingent that, we, uh, that is coming here to uh, to Clackamas County looking at uh, investment opportunities in our county and uh, I'll be one of the hosts for that. Um, the final point I'd like to make is um, you heard today uh, about some of the grant monies that we received from Metro and uh, I will point out that uh, a couple of years ago when I was campaigning that year Metro had four million dollars worth of grant monies that they were passing out to the counties and Clackamas County got none. Uh, this year pretty much every applicant application that we put in was funded this is what happens when you build positive working relationships with your partners in the region and uh, don't blame them for your problems. So that uh, concludes my comments for this week. Oh. And once again, I have to be reminded about the dog. <laughs> no, I'm, I actually am getting a no, another dog, but I'll tell you about that when it's my <laughs> turn. Okay. <laughs> so here we go. This is Annabelle. She is a nine-year young lab looking for a new adult family to give her lots of love. The environment at the shelter makes her a little nervous, so when you come to visit, please give her some time to adjust and get to know you. Sign her up for some obedience classes. An older dog can learn new tricks. She would enjoy a calm house with no children. She does like to chase things. What lab doesn't? So she will need a home with no cats. If you have another dog, please bring them to, in to meet and make sure they can be buddies. Come on down to dog services and ask to meet Annabelle today. For more information about Annabelle and other adoptable dogs, please contact Clackamas County Dog Services at 503-655-8628 or www.clackamas.us forward slash dogs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've had a wonderful week, as uh, all of my fellow commissioners know, I'm running unopposed to continue as Clackamas County Commissioner. I had scheduled quite a while ago a trip to uh, California for my grandson's third birthday party. They live in Silver Lake, which is just outside of Hollywood. And I've been there a few times since my grandchildren are there, of course. But this trip was especially special because I had some time to really think and reflect on our values and what's important. And I have to say, leaving our beautiful Clackamas County and going to California brings many things to mind. One uh, impression, at 11 p.m. after my husband and I finished seeing a musical called Allegiance, which 
deals with the internment camps and one story's family of that experience. It was a Broadway, it was in New York, it came to Los Angeles, we saw that. So I was reflecting a lot about the challenges of tolerance and diversity and inclusivity that not only did our country experience back in the World War II era, but we're experiencing again. So while reflecting on those issues and discussing that, at 11 p.m., we are just stuck in traffic. <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, how does that happen? So that makes me then think back to Clackamas County and how, oh, we have to really be thoughtful and planful about how we are growing because it's so important that we're, st we're strategic and we're, thought and we're thoughtful. Walking around in Los Angeles in the Silver Lake community, just trying to you know, get to a coffee shop, maneuvering um, terrible sidewalks. And in the neighborhood, my daughter couldn't keep us at her home in Los Angeles or in Silver Lake because she was full of guests for the party. So we actually stayed in an Airbnb. And I learned a lot about Airbnbs and quality of life while staying there because in her neighborhood, there is no, there's no restriction on parking, and there are so many Airbnbs in this neighborhood, and there wasn't any place to park. And so once we, we did rent a car, and we did try to stay there, but we could not park in the neighborhood because there were so many cars parked in the neighborhood. So that brings me again to quality of life and how we need to be thoughtful and planful as we grow into this new economy. And then lastly, also bringing me back to Clackamas County, my grandson is absolutely loves animals. He knows every animal. He talks about every animal. He introduces every animal. So at three years old, what does my daughter do? But she follows the tradi tradition that I set for her growing up and threw a great big birthday party for Augie and all 30 of his classmates and the friends from the neighborhood came to the party. And of course, on Saturday, it was raining. It was a big rainy day in Los Angeles. And not only that, but what did my daughter do for Augie for his birthday? She ordered a petting zoo of farm animals <laughs> to come <laughs> to their home. And there was a, um, it's alpaca a goat, a little pig, a bunch of bunnies, some chickens, and some ducks. And the kids just loved these animals. Every child was like, oh, the animals. And my grandson was so embracing the animals and talking about them and introducing people to all of the animals. And he was holding court with all the animals. And it was so fun and we were all celebrating. And we prepared him for this. We prepared him for the animals. We prepared him for all of his friends coming and playing with his toys. But we didn't prepare him for the animals leaving. So when the animals were time to go, poor little Augie was just in tears because that's, he thought those were his animals. So I said to my, my son-in-law, it's like, well, I think you need to move back to Clackamas County <laughs> and you need, to get a you need to get a farm and we need to fill it with animals because Augie really needs, can you come on back home to Clackamas County? So I didn't get a yes, but I got, he was thinking about it. But it brings me again to our amazing quality of life with our incredible neighborhoods, our wonderful landscape, our farm, our forest land, our 4-H, our fair, the incredible investment, the vast diversity. We have so much that we celebrate in this incredible community. So commissioners, we got so much work to do. We must stay steadfast. We have to be thoughtful, planful, strategic. We have the skills to do that. And Paul, thank you for all your knowledge on, and keeping up on all the transportation. We really need you, your expertise, your voice as we move forward. And I um, am inspired, I must say. Commissioner I'm not sure I can top that. I'm just saying, okay. <laughs> I will tell you though, in England, when they give kid birthday parties, they have the bouncy things, you know, those big, huge house things, and that gets pretty exciting. But you know, if I dare mention to my daughter a petting zoo, she'll kill me. I'm just telling you, okay. <laughs> she would. But you know, I'm a grandma. I might just, I might just take that on when I go there again. <laughs> 
believe that. Uh, so a number of things happened this week. Uh, Ken was kind enough to uh, help uh, moderate the China Forum in the afternoon. Uh, in the morning, I had an opportunity in the afternoon uh, to present about Clackamas County and all the business opportunities that we have here uh, for business investment and for opportunities for exporting uh, our products and our uh, goods uh, to China. And as, as Ken also mentioned, uh, tomorrow we have uh, another group from the China delegation. They're very interested in some of our initiatives on cross-laminated <coughs> timber. Um, it was a busy week with the Statewide Association of Oregon Counties. Our executive meeting Sunday night, uh, Monday, uh, all of our meetings, largely everything from transportation to human resources to public safety. Essentially in each meeting as uh, the first vice president, I actually went from meeting to meeting because I'm trying to listen in on uh, the dynamic. I'm proud to say it's a great organization. The staff is excellent. And what they largely did for all of us is to give us the update on the short session, what legislation passed, what legislation um, didn't pass, and where we are going to try and influence policies in the future as we start our work uh, about looking about what's going to be happening in the long session that's that's coming up. So that that took a that took kind of a day and a half. I went back to Salem on Tuesday because the other thing that we are doing as a group, the Association of Oregon Counties, we're teaming up with other counties across the, the state to take a close look at how our workforce uh, initiatives. Each, each county and region has its own workforce board. Uh, usually, in my case, I'm the commissioner on our workforce board. They, they are required by federal law to have an elected official. So we're taking a look at the system statewide to see what works well for us and what doesn't work well. And I had an opportunity again to, to point out, uh, because I had, had gone back to England, that the Sheffield model of how they um, manage to train young people is, is something that we really need to be looking, uh, looking at here as we move towards a system-wide cha uh, change. The good news is, this is kind of from the bottom up, it's not from the top down from the state agencies, these are actually the folks on the ground who run our workforce board. So the boots on the ground, we hope, are gonna have a larger influence on the policy. Another fun thing I did, I got, I went to Canby and I helped uh, take, uh, you know, to, to look at uh, essays written by young children from Lee Elementary School and um, their junior high school, and it was the Canby Heritage and Landmark Commission essay contest. So myself and other, other volunteers from the Canby community went through these essays. Uh, we've picked out 10 essays of distinction, and the topic was women, uh, who the children admire, who do they admire as women. And uh, needless to say, there was a lot of moms in the group, which was kind of heartwarming too, about how much they love their mom and how their mom uh, helps them get through things that they need to go through every day. So that was also, um, also a good, good opportunity. Um, last night I was at MPAC, a Metropolitan Policy Advisory Committee. That is kind of the land use component. Um, Paul is in the transportation component, but it, they overlap. So we did talk about the regional transportation plan last night, as well as talking about uh, the soon to come ur urban growth boundary expansion. And the area for, from our perspective to watch is Wilsonville. They are the city that has actually expressed the need for an urban growth boundary expansion. They have quite a bit of industry there, but they do need to have more. Um, affordable housing. Okay, so let's quick do arts and cultures in the, in the county. We can do that, Mary, and I'll do the report of the week. Pardon me? Go ahead, sorry. Oh, 24th annual airing of the quilts. This is going to be at the Milwaukee Center. Uh, basically, the 24th annual airing of the quilt show. There will be a variety of quilts, family heirlooms, and latest in fabric arts. You can uh, browse vendor booths, enter to win the raffle prize. I actually have my raffle tickets. And be the first to shop the Quilters Bargain Boutique. That's this Friday and Saturday, March 16th and 17th, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. at the Milwaukee Center. And the Three Rivers Artists Guild right here in Oregon City. They're going to have their March-April 
were rotation, pottery, original photography and paintings, glasswork and the new cottage crafts, section of textiles and much more. Complimentary coffee and appetizers provided and wine and beer for purchase. And that is Sunday, March 18th, uh, 1 to 3 p.m., Three Rivers Gallery and Gifts inside Singer Hill Cafe in our own Oregon City. Okay, and the word of the week? Martha Schrader. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost done, Jim, don't worry. Mary's trying to bring it up. Well, I can start reading it. The word of the week is gratitude. Uh, the quality or feeling of being grateful or thankful the word gratitude originated in the mid-1400s and is of late Middle English and medieval Latin origin. The parents were filled with gratitude watching their children help their neighbor into her house with her groceries. Okay. Great. Yeah. Uh, oops. Uh, I noticed that Clackamas Community College has a new president, Dr. Tim Cook, uh, originally from Clark College. Uh, Joanne Trosdell, uh, Clackamas County resident, rodeo person, uh, went to Clackamas Community College, became a doctor, uh, became the president for 10 years, and uh, she retired recently. Um, went to Vit Park Creek uh, yesterday to tour that facility. They do fantastic work. Uh, but uh, And they have a fundraiser next week, I believe. That is it next week? Oh. It's a ways away. Uh, if you haven't bought tickets and there's some available, please go. They need all the help they can get. Um, uh, you mentioned parking in in um, California. Uh, my step stepson works for the Pentagon in Washington D.C. You never take your car off the street ever unless you uh, have an emergency because you will never find a parking spot. The street is so thin that trucks drive down, take everybody's mirror off. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to add a, a C4 we met and uh, we had uh, talked about trans our retreat this summer, which is transportation and housing. Um, and uh, so, and other issues, uh, that C4 coordination committee we're trying to coordinate with our cities to get things done. And I want to invite both of you with grandchildren, because I have two new baby cows, and uh, one of them really likes me, and uh, I can pet it and hold on to it, uh, because that one almost died and I had to bottle feed it. Uh, but their they're, cows are amazing. You know, I mean, they're only two weeks old, and they run after one another and headbutt and have a lot of fun. It's, their cows are amazing. And the chickens are a lot of fun, too. It's just that you no. have to walk carefully or you trip over them because they are constantly at my feet. But no roosters, right? Oh, no roosters. No. Roosters. no, nope. no. Well, with that, uh, happy uh, St. Patty's Day. And we're late to go to a luncheon. Yep. So thank you very much for coming today. Mm -hmm.